I've hit record. Yeah. You know, click, click while you're interviewing, and they'll be like, <laughs> they'll be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> be like, you got a metronome in your house? What's that rattle? Did he say <laughs> rattle? That? <laughs> 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 right. uh, you have a snake now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just start hissing instead. Is, is there a snake? Make them think there's a snake in their room, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, actually, really quick, I got to fix one thing in OBS. I did not point it at the white right web browser. I'll fix that in a second, then we can start. There we go. No, not that one. Not that one. Not that one. That one. Okay. We're good. It's Monday, August 22nd, 2022. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we are going to advise you on how not to suck at getting a new smartphone. <laughs> Another one of those dates with a lot of twos in it. Yeah. Ah, two twenty-two, two oh two two. a lot of twos. I do like a lot of twos. Uh, there aren't that many big palindromic dates that are going to come up in the rest of our lives, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, we already had February 22nd, 2022. Yep. I, I mean, we had, we had November 11th, 2011 a while ago. Yep. So, uh, that was 2011, not 1,000. Yeah. Right. I mean, 1,011 happened, but nobody quite... Uh... <laughs> anyway, so uh, normally, uh, as you may know, the listener, that when Scott and I have an opening bit, something we might say at the start of the show, if we don't... No matter what happens in our lives, no matter how many things happen between when we do one Geek Nights and when we do the next Geek Nights, we will talk about one thing first, whatever's top of mind, and the rest is deleted from our brains forever. But I remember what I was going to say from Thursday when we skipped the show because a further incident happened today. So I have four biking related opening bits that i'm gonna blow through time for all four it's already they are very short i'll start with the most egregious one because it is the uh the funniest one to me so we biked over the weekend all up to terrytown just now i had some lunch bike back home it was like a nice chill biking day and uh about 10 miles south of terrytown i want you to guess what i saw parked on the side of the of the south county trailway you have one guess Yep, well, if it's it, parked, it has to be a vehicle. It's probably a city bike. It was one of the white, super expensive city bikes. Yeah, someone else posted a photo of it. I saw it. Yep, parked 10 miles. Up. So this thing was parked so far outside of New York City. <laughs> and uh, someone had stripped the entire front wheel off of it. Oh, the one I saw still had a wheel. Yeah. <laughs> it, was in, it was in good shape, but it was like in Terrytown. <laughs> <laughs> This was along the trailway, like, just south of Terrytown. Uh, yeah, I am 100% sure that one was stolen and someone rode it north until the GPS I, locked it out. I think people either, A, just don't realize that the bikes have time limits and yep. a certain range, or someone checks it out and somehow they lose it and someone else takes it, and they, now that person can just ride it with no consequences. I have seen a few times someone straight up steal someone's city bike and just bike off with it. Yeah, don't leave the city bike, you know. No, I'm talking like someone make sure that you someone was staying. This was a few weeks ago. Someone was just like, they pulled up near me. I was like waiting for a red light on a, on a city bike myself. And this dude just like pulls up, pulls off into the sidewalk, gets off the city bike and is standing near it, like right there, just looking at his cell phone. And some kid oh. just walks by and just grabs it and just bolts. Yeah, don't get off of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, today, just now, biking uh, home on the city bike i uh, come around the corner you know that u-turn to get on the queensboro bridge from manhattan there's like a weird intersection like in the bike lane just like this really weird u-turn and i'm coming in real slow on a slow ass city bike far to the right and two road bikers come around the corner at extremely high speed straight for me the first one sees that i'm there because i'm like in the lane uh and screeches to a stop like the whole rear wheel kicks up and her friend just slams into her from behind and they both eat shit and flip over right in front of me and they fall to the ground in a heap literally in front of me as I'm just stopped. They were kind of okay, but they must have been going like 15 or 20 miles an hour coming around that corner for some reason. 
I don't. I mean, it's a steep downhill, so you can you go fast, but at the bottom of it, you there's a hundred and eighty degree there's turn. A hairpin, there's yeah. a hairpin turn, you got, like literally, like it's really tight. You have this, to, this is like to stop. This isn't even like Mount Akino oh, situation. This is like that more advanced mountain that starts with an I from like season four of Initial D. Like this is some dangerous shit. Uh, and so the third incident, biking. That's not, that's not a car situation, right? No. Nope. Like. <laughs> Like some bikers make poor decisions too. Uh, coming home from work on Friday uh, or on Thursday, actually, right before that show, I'm biking, coming home, and uh, I see up in the distance on the bike path a ton of cops everywhere and a crowd. And I'm thinking, uh, am I might have to take a weird detour, big car accident. And as I approach, I discover a car has somehow has crashed in a place that it would take some effort to get a car into, completely blocking the bike lane and is completely just fucked up. But uh, the funny part is, so I slow down and I'm kind of laughing and taking a picture of it. And there's all these cops. And I overhear one cop talking to the other cop. I think they arrested the person who caused this accident based on or this collision based were on they, the cop. Were they perhaps intoxicated? Uh, I don't know. All I heard from the conversation was, I still don't know how they got the car in there. Well, I mean, that's there's a whole division right? yeah. that's like, you know, that investigates... Oh yeah, because what I, you, how much of a problem, right? Car crashes are. They have an entire division of police who are detectives who are experts at investigating that one exact thing and nothing else. They, you know, they look right? at like tire tracks and and the damage on the car and they, you know, every, you know. So my dad actually, I I learned to figure out exactly what happened. I weirdly learned a lot about that as a kid because my dad was a senior firefighter. So a firefighter is usually part of those kinds of investigations. Automotive forensics or whatever. Exactly, because it, it overlaps a little bit with arson investigation type stuff. Uh, so, like, law enforcement forensics often include EMTs and firefighters and other people. But also, he knew a lot of cops, and uh, he had he had the expected low opinion of police officers that you would uh, expect from someone like my dad. But uh, I remember as, a, as little kids, one thing he would he taught me and my brother is, like, what happens when there's a big car accident? Like, we'd be driving, and he'd see something, and he'd point out, oh, see, there's a guy in a white shirt right there, and another guy in a white shirt. Someone died. Like, he would tell, like, he taught us all these, like, here's how to know what's going on at a weird scene when there was a car collision of some kind. Mm -hmm. So last, the absolute bonkers story. Uh, so Thursday morning, the same day I encountered this accident, there's a collision. I'm dry, I'm biking to work. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy, is it? <laughs> I try. Website. I try really hard to yeah. never say car accident because there are there are so few car accidents that there's I could probably count zero car accidents. No, no. imagine imagine someone's driving twenty miles an hour and their car gets struck by lightning, killing them, and it then rolls over someone else who was also struck by lightning. That is an that accident is, involving a an, car. That is an accident, but it's not a car accident. No, nah. that's a anyway. accident. That's a weather accident. So I'm biking to work that same day on a city bike, and a car pulls into the bike lane to like make an illegal left turn and clips a delivery biker with his rearview mirror. And the biker's fine. The biker like swerves out of the way and flips him off and heads off. Uh, and there's a bunch of other bikers around, and it happens like right in front of me. So I just like bike around the situation and keep going, and I hear some yelling and honking behind me. Like, whatever. Just ignore that kind of situation. Definitely don't stick around for that kind of situation. Uh, nope. I keep biking. I get to the next intersection, and a car like turns left and cuts across the bike lane and just stops like in front of me and some other bikers. So I also ignore this situation. I just like bike around it and keep going. And I did not realize at that moment it was the same car that hit the delivery guy before. Some fancy bends. So then I, the third intersection, there's a red light. So I stop, and there's a few other bikers there. And suddenly someone comes up from behind me and forcibly pulls me off my stop city bike. And this dude just starts screaming at me that I hit his car. Kick him in the nuts and run away. So... I did the move that I have done a few times in my life. I highly recommend this move. This is one of the <laughs> surest ways to get out of this kind of situation. Don't actually call the cops because that's a mixed bag, but pretend you're calling the cops. So I back away from this guy a little bit, and he's like holding onto the city bike and like, you can't leave. You hit my car. You can't leave. He's flipping the fuck out. So I'm like, I'm going to call the cops. And I pull my phone out, and I just like fake it, and I hold it up, and he, he backs off a little bit. 
And he seems to think that I'm going to call the cops and the cops are going to come and sort out his insurance situation with, you know, this biker that he claims hit him. And then I just start saying nonsense. I just start lying into the phone. I'm like, yeah, this crazy guy is attacking me. I'm on, I'm on this street at this intersection. No, this guy's flipping out. I start describing the guy to nobody on my cell phone. So the guy actually backs off a little bit more, but he won't leave. And he's like, he seems to hesitate a little bit. He looks down for a second, and I just hop back on the city bike and fucking book it. Mm. <gasps> Behind me, I hear him yelling, you can't fucking get away from me. And I hear a car door slam and tires screeching. He screeches forward in the road, almost causing a collision. I said it right that time. <laughs> and he's clearly going to try to like head me off at the next intersection. So I see his car just go past, and then I just backtrack like 10 feet. And just go down a side street, and I'm gone. And I have no idea how that situation resolved itself. <laughs> Do not engage the nope. angry, dangerous person. Nope, not at all. But I got to tell you, pretending to call the cops on someone loudly and in front of them is a pretty easy way to get out of a lot of situations. Because unless someone is actually insane, that'll give most aggro people a tiny bit of pause. Mm. So yeah, that was, that was, those are my biking stories. Got any news? <laughs> uh, let's see what's in the news. Let's talk about that open the, the the program illegally packaged in fourteen distributions. Oh, okay. So yeah, so if you write a program in the Go programming language, we did an episode about this, right? Where, you know, it's it's likely that it will be statically linked. So any libraries that you included are going to also the code of those libraries will be included in your executable that you have, you know, you that comes out of the the Go compiler, right? Which means, you know, that's different than, say, if you write a C program and you just dynamically link a library, nah. right? So that means the person running the software has to go get that library on their own and install it somewhere else, right? And that means, let's say you were to include some open source library in your software, right? It's like, well, if it's dynamically linked, it doesn't really matter what, you know, it's like your, the license of your program can be anything because yep. your only your program only includes code that you wrote so you can give it whatever license you want and even though it may depend upon code that someone else wrote it's not you're not including that you're not giving out copies of that you're just saying yeah if you want to use my program that has this license you're going to need to on your own obtain that other software that has a different license you know, it, it, <laughs> right? But if it's statically linked, well, it's included, right? You're you're giving out someone else's code along with your code, and so this per person, you know, was looking into it, and they found some software that a lot of people are using that includes other software that has like no license, <laughs> what to speak of, right? And the the license of the software that includes the no license software, right? does not line up and it's it's like this isn't open source bro it's like, <laughs> you can't be doing this but all kinds of people are doing it because who's paying you know who, nobody is like you know checking these things over outside of large companies right well never mind that the the status of how much enforcement you could get of any of this stuff is not 100 percent settled in court well, there's no, you know, there's no reason to do any enforcement when none of these people, you know, even though these different open source slash free to various extent softwares are, you know, I guess, well, the, the one with no license isn't free, but it's just sitting there on GitHub. There it is. You can see all the, right? It's like people are just using it. Yeah. <laughs> they just didn't bother to put a license on it. So it's like no one's making any money there's nothing to to enforce what are you going to enforce right it's yeah well i guess you have to show what damage was caused to you yeah it's like there's nothing but you know that's that's the problem there there was a copyright infringement surely um but there's probably all sorts of incidents like this and i think it's a good argument that for open source distributions you should be sticking to dynamically linked things right uh, to avoid these kind of situations. And then you just need to check the licenses of the programs that you are directly including because it's basically going to be next to impossible to actually check all the licenses of statically linked things. It's like you, you have to, <laughs> it's hard, right? Yeah. To find out what's in there. You know, it's a lot of effort. So, but yeah, so the story kind of blew up because people are like, oh, snap. <laughs> Oops. 
And this is the tip of the iceberg of this kind of thing, just in the general open source ecosystem, of course. Yeah, this happens all the time. This The only reason this blew up is because someone actually decided to take a few minutes to like look into it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, this probably happens every damn day. Yep, and it's hard to say how, mo like, how much of a problem it is. Should anything be done? done about it like that's those are questions that very few people care about the answers to to be honest no but if you're promising you know open source software to someone else yeah right, you know you have to make sure that your your end is is legit yeah of course how many people just make stuff and license it creative commons but they use material that is not compatible with that license that they just got from somewhere you see that a lot out on the internet especially in creative works Especially in Geek Nights. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there is very little. I will, I will say that there's very little in Geek Nights that is not duly licensed. We're, we're conscious of it, but, you know. Yeah. The, the one that's the most dangerous is also the one that only one person has ever recognized. And uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of panel slides that took just images from Google Image. Search. Only old ones. Actually, I have been extremely studious about getting licenses for every image we use or having a clear fair use defense for at least five years now. Every slide. Yeah. And I have an Adobe YouTube stock account YouTube that I pay videos, for. Right. There are YouTube videos out there. Right. Which are, you know, maybe. And then the Zeke Nights episodes with some audio clips here and there. Yep. Mm. The stingers might, might be a problem. But anyway, a uh, little fun thing. There's an app. Uh, I'm not endorsing this app. I have not, like, done a full security analysis of it or anything. Like, do not uh, think that I am saying anything more than what I'm saying right now. But me and Scott and a few of our friends are trying out this uh, Be Real app. It's just one little app it's, among it's, many. It's the cool new thing the kids are doing. And usually when the kids are doing a cool new thing, like the TikToks or the Snapchats, I just ignore that shit. Yep. But the Be Real is a cool new thing. And I was like, all right, you know, this seems like a thing that can replace Wordle, right? Yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with it to replace Wordle. It's my Wordle once a day time. thing. Yep. I, you know, it's basically the way it works is once a day, at an unknown time, you don't know when, uh, but it will be during a typical awake hour. I'm curious like to see what it's going to do when I'm in London and you're all at home. You, but uh, You can change the time. There's four time selections. You would change it. Oh, yeah, but I wonder what it'll do for me in regard to all of you. You have to change it to... Anyway. Um, but, yeah, see, so you... Uh, it picks a time at random, but it's the same time for everyone in your zone of the world, right? The world, I think they split into four or five pieces, yep. basically. And a notification pops up. So you have to give this app notification permission. Otherwise, it's kind of useless. Uh, and when that notification pops up, you have two minutes to take a photo. You can't prepare anything like fucking Instagram or yep. you know, Photoshop anything. But unless you sit there all day waiting for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> You take a photo, and it will take a photo simultaneously with both the front and rear cameras on your phone, and then you can add a caption to it, and then it posts it. And you're basically, you know, sharing one photo a day. You can't overshare or undershare, yep. right? Well, you can undershare. You can just not participate. You don't see what anyone else shared that day unless you also share that day. So there's like an incentive into yep. sharing every day. You can uh, post late if you miss it, but it tattles on you and tells all your friends, oh, Rim posted this one two hours late, so read into that what you will. Yeah, I cheated once, right? It's like you can cheat and just post late, but it tells everyone. And I'm sure there's probably some way to hack this thing. It's like, you know, all, this only happens if you use the app in good faith. You could find some way to hack it and send, you know, interface yep. with their API that I'm sure exists and just post whatever you want. But I guess here's what I like about it. It's simple. It just works. It doesn't ask me to do a lot. Like there's not a bunch of features and nonsense in there. Uh, it doesn't charge me any money. It. Doesn't show me any uh, ads. Uh, yeah. I look at it exactly once a day. There's nothing to look at in there unless I want to go look at my own history, which is already actually pretty interesting to be honest. Yeah. So yeah, it's, you know, I think it's really getting back to like what, you know, the, a lot of the apps were like supposed to be in their, their early days. Right. It's like, there's this sort of problem where, you know, people's Instagram feeds or Facebook feeds, they're taking pictures of like the best exciting parts of their lives. And you yep. get sort of this false impression that everyone's having a great time doing awesome shit all yep. the time. Cause like you think that rim literally, what if you like, if you, if I did my curated my life that way every day, I'm either having a fancy cocktail or traveling the world or like on an Epic bike ride, but with be real, 
I had an epic bike ride on Sunday, but you know what my B-Real photo is? Half awake, <laughs> in the dark, in my pajamas, watching a rerun of Deep Space Nine <laughs> on the TV. Yeah, it's like there are some days where it's like I did jack all that day, but B-Real happens to pop up like it's something at least mildly interesting, like the grocery store. Yep. Right? And there are other days where it's like I was at the beach and I was at a party, right? And when does B-Real pop up? Like after I've gotten home and I'm poking the computer. And it's yep. like... I'm going to get mostly poking the computer f photos here. Why? Where are we yeah. the day? It's like, you know, but it's, yeah, it's going to, you know, it's a once a day thing. It'll be entertaining for a brief period of time uh, until the event, as soon as they take advantage of, you know, privacy violating or advertisement showing or send me a notification other than the notification that says it's be real time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to delete it instantly. <laughs> So uh, the uh, listeners already pointed out, you know, I'm sensing a lot of porcelain throne picks. Uh, that has not happened yet, but, yeah, but we're waiting for it. We anticipate it. All I'm going to say is I have decided one, I'm only going to be friends with people in this app that I am like close, personal, like in-person, serious friends with. And two, uh, I'm going to go hard. I'm going to do it. If I'm pooping, <laughs> guess what? I mean, I wouldn't take a picture down low. No, I'm not taking a picture of my poop and or the, yeah, the pooping apparatus. You would see my face. You would see that I'm clearly in a bathroom and you would see the door to the bathroom or the yeah. back of it. You're, you're <laughs> going to see what I'm up to. <laughs> some towels, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in some other news, uh, there's a California school uh, in Fresno High School and they have decided to ban cell phones. Full stop. Kids just can't bring cell phones into the school right. well, I mean, at all in anymore. In New York City, they tried this at one point, and what happened was there were these trucks that would set up outside the school, and kids would pay the truck person to take their phone, hold on to it, sort of like a coat check, and then give the phone back when the kid left school yep. for like a small you know, deposit fee. Uh, are these kids going to just leave their phones at home, or is someone going to come along with a, a phone deposit yep. truck? Again? I mean, this is all stupid. You want to know why? Schools suck and kids hate them. Shit like this. The same of kind course. of crap happened when we were kids. I remember I got in deep shit because I brought, I brought my Walkman to school. Walkmans were banned in my middle school, despite the oh, fact that been. I only used it to listen to music on the bus. But the fact that it was in my locker was a big fucking deal to the school. But anyway, uh, this is stupid. That whole concept is stupid. But I want to point something out here. The question is more around... Why are schools doing this? God, why would a school do this? What are their that actual first grade ban trapper keepers? <laughs> yep. Now, on one hand, some schools make the rationalization that these devices are distracting kids. But kids are. Uh, I, do you forget what it was like being a kid? I could be distracted by nothing in middle school. A, a, a leaf could blow by the window and I'm gone. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> kids well, will think... distract themselves. They'll draw the cool S on their desk if they have to. Yep. I think what it is, is that, you know, you, the, at least from the perspective of someone who went to American public schools, yep. right, is that there were problems with kids that would happen, right? You know, mm -hmm. various problems, right? Like one kid has a trapper keeper, the other one doesn't. So it causes jealousy, conflict, yep. et cetera, right? Or, you know, it's like some kid has a cool hat and then, you know, other kid bullies and takes the hat or, it's like, you know, these objects, right, become sort of involved in, you know, misbehavior conflict. But the right? key is the misbehavior conflict is the problem. The bully kid is the problem, not the fact exactly. that someone had a hat. Right. So they always, so the teachers sort of see these objects, magic cards, trapper keepers, phones, right, which are used for, you know, cyberbullying or whatever. No. Right, are these tools or catalysts that are being used and involved in all, like every incident the teacher sees there's something you know, a phone is involved somehow or yep. some object isn't so like let's get rid of all these things because it's a thing they can actually do with their power that they had the limited power because have. children have definitely never misbehaved in school until the advent of modern technology. We know that for really? a fact. <laughs> right. It's like you know, it's but it's a thing that is within the power of the teachers and the school administration to ban objects of various kinds from the school. And so because they can do it, and it's like that's what they do, right? They, yep. they have the hammer and there's you know And I think a lot of it is around this misplaced idea of this wanting a sense of control over the kids. Yeah. But and so that they end up doing it and it doesn't actually solve the real problem, which is that if the kids are 
shitty or the teachers are shitty or the yep. school system is shitty it's going to be shitty no matter what they bring it yeah if you had an awesome school all the kids would be able to bring whatever they want and they would be cool to each other because everyone would be cool you okay. want to fix those problems uh i don't know start by paying teachers more and have more teachers i mean do you see like half the teachers in ohio are going to go on strike right before school starts because they're not good. getting paid shit good so I mean, uh, it's like I say this all the time, but like, you know, give it my ideal life is a life of not working. Right. Yeah. But if I have to work, my ideal job would be like teach computers to kids that what's better than that. Nothing's better than that. I'd yeah. rather do that than do anything else. Right. There are there are a lot of things that would make society better that I would gladly spend 40 hours a week doing not just right. doing, but doing with uh, with an actual sense of inspiration and purpose enthusiastically doing. Right. Why don't so why don't I do that? I could do that. Why don't I? Because you need a master's. You'll have to get a master's, and they'll pay you thirty k. The barrier to entry to do it is high. It's harder to get that job than it is to get the job I have. Yep. Right. Number two, I know because I, I understand the world that that job will not consider. Will con the the part of it that I imagine that I really want to do, teach kids computers, will actually be a small percentage of that job. Most You'll mostly job be a glorified babysitter being paid paid thirty k a year. Most of that job is going to be comprised of other bullshit that is not what I want to do, which is help kids understand the joy of computers and have yep. a great time and learn and, and go on to lead wonderful lives and knowing computers better, right? And three, right, the compensation, right, considering the barrier to entry is high and the hassle of the job is high... The compensation is lower. It's worse. Way yep. magnitude, orders of magnitude worse than the job I have, which is easier to get and less hassle. <laughs> right. So it's like, why would anyone teach? Right. But that's what they, that's what the system, right. They, yep. they don't want good teaching because good teaching would bring about the good democracy. Right. So and people in charge of our country don't want that because <laughs> they're anti-democratic. So not to get too much deeper because we got to move on to some other news. And of course the main bit, but the reason I bring up this story specifically is because cell phones are different from a lot of the other things school has ban have banned up to this point. Mm -hmm. I would argue that cell phones are just an integral, natural part of the modern world. Everyone having a smartphone in their pocket is not only a goal, but a necessity of the modern world. It is so much more positive than negative. Uh, there are plenty of ways to handle the possible distractions of smartphones in a school. And guess what? When kids have a job after high school, they're going to have a cell phone, so they'd better learn how to deal with about the same. I was mad about calculators in the same way, right? Yep. I was like, I'm going to have a calculator my whole life. Why would you have a no calculator test? My high school never had no calculator tests. We, they were rare, but they had them. And even though the few we had, I was mad. I was like, this is bullshit. And then they'd be like, you can't use a program on your calculator. And I'm like, I wrote the program. Uh, I, I, I uh, had a very similar situation. I also wrote a program that made it look like you were wiping all the programs off of your calculator. We had that too. <laughs> we had but anyway, that too. so uh, why are schools mad about cell phones specifically? Uh, this story actually gives you a very clear window into that. This ban comes... Not too long after, this exact school had a problem where a kid dressed up in a KKK hood in school and some shit went down. And the reason this all came out, kids had cell phones. And they took fucking pictures of it and documented that it happened. Good. Yeah. I think <laughs> schools are banning cell phones solely because they are afraid that the students will use the cell phones to document all the egregious shit that happens in our schools. Good. I think that is the sole reason schools are getting so aggressive on cell phones. Everything else they say is an excuse. This is the reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, in some other news, uh, this is a dicey one. Remember a while back we were talking about Apple and their plan to detect hashes of CSAM, which is an acronym for basically child porn to, you know, that, that whole story. Well, uh, that type of technology doesn't actually work that well, and now we have a specific case where that technology ran afoul of the real world. Right, so this dude uh, had a kid, and his kid's junk had a medical issue, some yep. kind of infection. Right? Oh, you know what? Fun fact, I had some medical issue with my junk when I bruised it uh, in a bike accident not that long ago, and guess what I did? I did the exact same thing this father did, and a doctor saw, looked at a picture of my junk that I sent to them with my smartphone. 
Right. So this guy takes a picture of his toddler's junk with his phone and yep. sends it to the doc his doctor, his pediatrician, yep. who prescribed antibiotics, which f cleared up the issue. Good yep. job, doctor. Right? He could just tell what it was from looking at it. Um, a plus, right? So uh, what happens is Google comes along and uh, the automatic porn child porn detector detected some child porn and shut him down, right? Just deleted his account, banned him, etc. And, you know, he goes, and, and also the police were notified, and the police investigated, right? Somehow, miraculously, uh, the police saw the truth. They saw that exactly what had happened, right? It's like, okay, they investigated. They, nothing wrong with investigating. I don't see any problem with that. That's prudent, right? And But after they investigated, they discovered no crime has been committed here. This is not child porn. This was perfectly fine. We're not going to do anything about it. No charges, no nothing. Just, they did the right thing. Google didn't do the right thing. Google's like, you're banned forever. We're not even going to say anything. We're not going to do anything. <laughs> right? You're just banned forever. Deal with it. Yep. Right? All your photos are gone. All your emails are gone. Now, this is where this whole concept of using hashing algorithms to identify this type of content on platforms, I would argue, is at least today with present technology, fundamentally flawed in the same way that ShotSpotter is fundamentally flawed in the same way that a bunch of news came out today. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it, but how ShotSpotter causes more problems than it solves. It's true. It it, it is you know it, it is a problem, but I think that even in this case, I don't. I don't think this is a, a great argument for getting rid of the child porn. This detector. is a at, at most. This, this is, is a, a great argument for companies like Google cannot do this stuff unaccountably and non-transparently. Exactly right. I wrote a whole thing in our forum, which you could join if you wanted to read it. Right. I, when the story came out, I wrote a whole thing. Community.frontrowcrew.com. Uh, right. Is that there needs to be some sort of government consumer protection law, right? That if, you know, for, we have online accounts. Some of the online accounts are just bullshit, like yep. our forum, right? Yeah. You should join. Get a bullshit account today. It's free. Uh, but some accounts, people, their livelihoods depend on those accounts, right? If you have an eBay account, you're running an eBay yep. store. That could be your job. Our right? Google Domains account. account Because you're a YouTube creator and that's your job. Not only am I fucked if I somehow lost access to my Google account, but Geek Nights is fucked. Like, right. <laughs> It's like, if I lose access to my Google account, somehow, not only am I fucked, many other people are fucked on top of, right? That are yep. under my digital umbrella, right? It's like, it's not just a hassle. It's like a devastating, life-ruining thing, and it should not be permitted to happen. I'm not saying it shouldn't be permitted to happen under any circumstance. Oh, yeah. To people, like, if, a, if you find out a Nazi's, on, if a Nazi's on your platform, you absolutely should fuck them over. Right. But... Something like that, an important account upon which someone's livelihood is dependent, should not be able to be shut down without an open, transparent review with some sort of judicial process, mm -hmm. right? And someone who has the, a human being with the power to make a decision, yes or no, right? Should examine evidence and hear, you know some sort of it doesn't have to be a full-on fucking trial with a jury of your peers even though that wouldn't be bad right but something you know an arbitrator i don't know right lawyers figure it out but there needs to be something there can't just be automated email that says no yep. with no explanation with no recourse with no well nothing. this is the logical yeah. conclusion of megacorps like google and amazon and facebook one existing and two aggressively moving to a model where there is no way to ever talk to a human to get help under any circumstances i dare you to interact with google in a way where a human will talk to you Right. We need a, well, I can do it because we have the, if you pay for Google workspaces, you can do it. Nope. Whatever they change the name of it to now. <laughs> it's a, but yeah, if you. Of course, how much help did we actually get in that whole uh, situation? <laughs> nah, you need to, have, we need a consumer protection law that forces their hand, right? You must have a human being who can talk and will listen and knows what's up, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yep. Some sort of remedy must exist, and it currently does not, and your life can just be fucked over for no reason, right? Unjustly. All right, that's probably plenty of news. I think we should just go right into things of the day. But anyway, things of the day. So check this out. This is a tweet thread with 16 tweets, and each of these is an image from 
an illustrated hand scroll from the 1850s in Japan mm. that was seven meters long, and it shows the entire process end to end of how sake was made in cowboy times in Japan. Mm. And it is annotated, and it is absolutely delightful. This this is actually a fun journey to follow, start to finish. This that is sake made with great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> that was but also at a scale like it's funny because the the Japanese equivalent of you know, like in America we've got the trope of the jug with three X's on it. In Japan, I feel like it's that big like yellowish barrel looking thing that sake comes in with the writing on the side and the ropes around it. Same thing. Yep. Yep, exactly. That's just a jug with three X's on it. Pretty much. <laughs> so what do you got? So this dude, uh, he decided, you know, he likes typewriters. And, you know, I kind of like the aesthetic of a typewriter. The problem is you sit down to use one for a few minutes, and it's like, okay, the keyboard's actually not as nice as my mechanical keyboard, even though it's aesthetically cooler. And then as soon as you make a mistake in typing and you press backspace, you're like, oh, fuck. What? You uh, one, uh, even when I was, like, in elementary school, our typewriter had a backspace that actually worked and would remove would words. Out. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it wasn't white was out. It the X was it the X kind. It wasn't white out, but it was very similar to white out how it actually worked. I, I don't want to get into it. It's uh, it's more complicated than you think. The way backspace worked on electric typewriters is way different than you think it was. That'll be my next thing of the day. Anyway, proceed. Sure. But anyway, this guy hooks up his typewriter to his computer, right? And he basically hooks up the terminal to the typewriter. So now when he types on the typewriter, it's typing on the paper, but it's also sending those characters to the computer as terminal input. And then when he presses enter and the terminal makes output, the typewriter is printing the output as like it's a printer. That is, a, that is super cool because that is kind of how it was to interact with terminals in the early days. Yeah. The only difference is that, you know, you can... If, if you type something like LS, it works great, right? But it's, if you want to open up a, an, a, like a terminal app where it's actually redrawing the nah. desk, it's going to, or if, you know, this. Well, I want to just print a whole page after you hit enter. Yeah, it, you know, it can become, and it's also really slow and noisy, obviously, but it's still pretty cool. But, you know, I encourage people to, it's all video series, watch as much of it as you feel. Uh, but There's some charm to that. Yeah. But if you are uh, interested in any of this, you should Google. There's plenty of resources telling you exactly how Terminal's TTY works. And it's an important thing to know because I feel like even a lot of computer people these days, they just click on Terminal, the application, on their computer, or whatever, or whatever they're using, PuTTY, iTerm, fucking, I don't know, Gnome Terminal, X, yeah. whatever, right? And they don't know actually how, what the hell's going on behind that thing. Uh, and it's kind of important to know and really helpful to know. So. Yep, the, the history of computing is wrapped up in this. One of the first things I ever did connected before I even had access to the internet, I was able to basically mess, me and a guy were able to use terminals to mess with each other's computers directly via a phone line that we just called each other on. And we did some fun stuff with that. That was like my introduction to networking. Mm-hmm. In the meta moment, the Geek Nights Book Club book is Binti. It's a very short read. I don't think I... We could probably do it on Thursday next week. Uh, you said that last Thursday. We I didn't do a Thursday show? <laughs> Have you started it yet? I didn't. I didn't. I still haven't even read one page. Uh, well, let me double check my travel schedule. Uh, Geek Nights, I'll warn you all now in the meta moment, Geek Nights is going to get actually moderately disrupted in September. Because, one, uh, me and Emily and I are flying to Seattle to uh, do a panel or two at PAX West. Uh, and also, I do have to do a work trip. I got to go to London and Frankfurt, so I'm going to be gone for a couple weeks. And Bring back COVID again? <laughs> well, we'll see. This is not going to a convention. This is just going to my offices there. So I should be able to avoid pretty much all people and wear a mask. And like it won't be like the it's conference I went to in London. Airplanes trouble? Uh, probably not, because I can just wear a mask on the airplane, and I'll be in business class, pretty isolated from everyone. I'm not, not actually worried about that. I am 100% sure I caught it at the conference when I was in London last time, based on the timing. Anyway, 
Uh, but also, Emily and I are doing a long bike trip. We're going to bike from our apartment to Brockport, which is a little bit past Rochester, New York, over the course of a week. So, uh, might be several weeks of no geek nights as a result. Just going to give you guys a heads up on that. That'll give me some time for uh, things that start with the letter B, like biking, going to the beach, and building the, the Geek Nights website. Oh, all the Bs. Meanwhile, you're going to get a lot of side content. On that bike trip, one thing we do want to do is record a little like progress thing every day of the journey because we're basically biking 500 miles over the course of a week. Rim fell down three times today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got this. We got another thing that starts with B bones. What bones are remaining? Yep. How much dysentery? Did you ford that river? <laughs> <laughs> We're on a ferry right now. Good thing. Good thing we got money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's all the meta I got. I guess we can dive right into it. Let's talk about smartphones because uh, one yeah, Apple Day is right, coming up. Right now is like the peak smartphone season, right? The Pixel Six A just came out, which is the like the second tier Pixel phone, right? Um, I think it, I think Six A, right? I think I'm right. Um, and then the iPhone, right? Early September is when they're going to, Apple is going to have like the biggest announcements, right? You've ever seen, right? It's like, we always know early September is the announcement time, but we got new phones. There's going to be new Apple watch for sure. Right. Those are, those are guaranteed, right? I'm hoping for new AirPods pro two. If they don't make those, I won't buy them, <laughs> but I think they hope <laughs> they'll come soon. There's going to be some new iPad action, and there might be some other Macs that don't have M2 chips in them yet. We'll get upgraded to M2 chips. There's going to be a lot of Apple shit, all right? Um, regardless, it is new phone season, especially going to the holiday season, back to school season, right? Re even if new phones weren't coming out now, this is the time when people are buying new phones, right? Yep. So whether you are buying a, a brand new phone, you never had one before because you're a punk kid, uh, or just weren't wealthy before, or who knows, <laughs> uh, or you're replacing a phone, right? We're going to give, give a bunch of tips on what the hell you should do. Yep. So number one, the most important thing is, I mean, I'm not going to say, do you need a smartphone? What are you going to use it for? Like that high level, because I would argue that everyone who can afford a smartphone should probably have a smartphone in the year 2022. There is service for the smartphone. Yep. It, it's, pro it's beneficial for you to have it. Right? So the real question is, what other devices do you have or expect to have so that you can think about where and how that smartphone fixed it, fits into your life? Case in point, I have a laptop and a workstation. So for me, a smartphone is primarily the my access to data when I'm traveling or not near those other devices. So as a result, I got the tiniest possible phone. Yeah, I, this is for pooping and biking and like being out in the street. I got something that'll fit in my pocket and I really only use it when I'm away from my real devices. And that really colors what I care about in a smartphone compared to someone who say, you don't have a home computer. You don't have a laptop. Do you want a smartphone that is also your primary device for literally everything? Or do you want a smartphone and separately... Which is a perfectly legitimate choice given the prices of these smartphones these days. It absolutely is. Or do you want a small fart smartphone, I almost said fart phone, and, uh, and a tablet? Because a tablet is a very different thing from a smartphone. But you have to decide what kind of life do you live. Some people are best off with a big smartphone. Some people are best off with a tiny smartphone and a big-ass tablet. And some people are off with a high-end smartphone, the newest, most powerful one. Yep. And some people are better off with, like, you know, you can get a lower-end model, right? Or a cheaper model, right? Or, you know, older one. They still sell, you know, iPhone, what, you know. You can get the, like I just said, the 6A came out, which is not the most powerful nope. uh, Pixel phone, right? Yeah, you can get an iPhone 11 still. You can get the iPhone SE, right? There's a new iPhone SE, in fact, new-ish, right? You can get one of those. It's like, that might be good enough for you. Right? Yeah. You, don't, you might not need to get, you definitely, you know, iPhone 13, it's like, yeah, that's probably just fine for just about anyone. The iPhone 13 Pro is kind of just a ridiculous thing, even if that's your only computing device. It's like... It's not that much better than the iPhone 13, except for the cameras. So yep. it'd be like 
Though, if here's an example. Somehow are making really high quality photos and videos, but you don't have another camera, then the iPhone 13 Pro makes sense. Otherwise, it doesn't. Another use case, if you're doing photogrammetry and you want to use that LiDAR and you want to do scans of 3D things, yeah. that is something that there's really no other cheap device that's going to do it. That is such a win for you to buy that specific phone. Yeah, but how many people is that? Almost nobody. Exactly. So uh, if you're the kind of person who's got something weird like that going on, you don't need our advice. I assume you already have a very clear plan of what kind of devices you need. But for most people, it doesn't really matter that much. So it really comes down to, do you want a laptop? Do you want a phone plus other devices or just a phone? Because if you want just a phone, I actually would say you probably want to get a bigger phone. And it's pretty much 50-50 Android or iPhone if you're in yeah, that well, boat. The, I think, you know, the Android or iPhone thing is really going to depend on what else is going on in your life, right? You so know, do you already have one of the two and a lot of apps and things you have paid for on that yeah. device? Yeah, just stick with it. You'll you stick with it. If you're already on one, you know, it's like, you know, you can argue all day about which one's better than the other, but if you're already in one of them, it's like, that one's probably better for you unless you're so barely invested in it that switch your switching yep. cost is low. I made um, the switch from Android to iPhone, and you know what? The switching cost kind of high. Like it's not. It kind of sucks to switch from the Google Android ecosystem to the iPhone ecosystem, or vice versa. Like if you're already in one and you don't have a specific complaint or a specific need, don't switch. Like only switch if you have a good reason to. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it's like, what do you use for, do you have email already? Right. It's like, if you already got email and it's Gmail, you might want to go the, the Google way. Right. Yeah. If you're some kid who's never had a phone before. Right. It's like, well, you don't have an email either way. Well, what do your parents have? What do your friends have? Right. You know, if you, if your friends are all iMessaging, get an iPhone so you can iMessage with them and yep. FaceTime with them. If your friends, you know, if, if your parents have Google accounts, right. It's like. You know, if your dad's got an Android phone or your guardian, whoever has an Android phone, get an Android phone. It'll be more compatible with what they have. If your parents have iPhones, right, you can get an iPhone and an iWatch. And now they can do that shit where they, you know, they can find you if you get lost in the woods. Because <laughs> right. buy an Apple Watch or die is, is Apple's marketing still. Yeah. <laughs> your children will die. <laughs> so one thing I would say, uh, and I actually, I have very prescriptive advice. I don't think Scott will disagree. If... Now, this might change soon because there are new Android watches like Android War things coming and there are apparently some big changes. But if you want a smart watch, I would say go Apple because the Apple watch is perfectly fine. And the best Android watch I have ever used is kind of shit. Yes, there's, if, if, there's, if you really need the smart watch as a part of your life for reasons... You really just got to go the Apple way, the, you know, the Apple Like, I, even, even back when I was deep in the Android ecosystem and it was not considering switching, I was very vocal about the fact that every, app, every Android watch is absolute garbage. There are no good ones. They just, there are so many terrible annoyances with them. And the Apple watches, by comparison, they just, they have intelligent defaults and they kind of just work in a way that no Android accessory is capable of. If you don't care about the watches, this does not apply to you. But if you care about a watch and you want a smart watch, in my opinion, there is no answer but an Apple watch. And if you want an Apple watch, there is no answer but an Apple phone. The choice is made for you. That is the only factor that matters. The benefits of the watch, uh, if you're not sure if you want one or not, right, is obviously the, you know, the, their major selling point for all the watches, yep. not just the Apple ones, is that, oh, we'll prevent you from dying. We'll detect if your heart is going crazy. <laughs> it's like, you know, that you may believe that. It's partially true, right? The heart rate um, monitors, so, the O2 monitors, they're great. Yeah. Uh, the, the real benefits of the watch is that, number one, if you have the LTE watch, which is going to cost you a little bit every yep. month, you can actually go and leave your phone behind, which is great if you're running or swimming or anything of that nature, right? You can just go with the watch only and you won't miss an important emergency phone call or anything like that. And yep. you don't have to carry a phone around no matter how small. Even without the LTE, sometimes I often run. I don't even carry my phone. I just have my watch. Even without the LTE, I guess the 5G now. It still works because it can still do things like Strava. It just doesn't have the communication aspects. 
Right, but I mean, if someone were to make an emergency phone call, you wouldn't. Yeah, get I wouldn't get through to me. There was Wi-Fi or something. You just happened to be yep. here. But like around the apartment, I can just wear my watch, and it'll t- like I don't actually have to have my phone on me in the apartment. My watch, which just has Wi-Fi, will buzz. I can even take the call on it if I need to. Yeah, the things I use on my watch the most often are a notifications show up on the watch, so yep. I don't have to get my phone out of my pocket. Which my watch is how I don't miss it. the be reels. Right, and then it, that's how I don't have to turn the phone on. The phone's battery lasts longer yep. because of the watch, right? Not, I don't have to use the phone as much. Two, Strava. Uh, I use Strava and the heart rate meter and exercise. Like, that is that is my primary workflow on my watch. I did until I got the bike computer, and now I use that instead. Yep, that's I mean, most of my sports thing. are if not I running, biking. I would use Strava on the watch. Yep. Mo- I mean, I do. most of what I do is skiing, running. Biking is actually a secondary concern. But also, at this point, I don't even bother with a bike computer. My phone and watch handle everything I could ever need. All right. uh, my, my bike computer is also a GPS and whatnot. Anyway, yeah. So the uh, other thing the watch does is payments right so it's like yeah you can use apple pay or android pay with the phone yeah good fucking luck do you know how many times android at pay on a watch was fucky or didn't work quite right or like it you had to re-authenticate the apple payment on the watch just works yep so it's like pay you know it's like you think oh i get to take my phone out and use the apple pay yeah that works great but apple pay on the watch is just like even faster it is literally just you double tap a button and just hold it up to whatever and everything just works it just pays instantly you're done yeah so if you're you know pretty much every almost every business i interact you know where it doesn't work sit down restaurants (laughs) they they need a credit card you can't even pay with your phone i've in just the past month i've experienced this there are more and more sit down restaurants using some payment system where they bring you the receipt oh yeah the the receipt has a qr code and you, you can't use the watch for this, obviously. You photo the QR code with the phone, and then you pay with Apple Pay or Android Pay or whatever the payment thing is on your phone. Yep. And then you just leave. Uh, you don't the, have to wait. I have seen more and more places doing the European style, like just in the last couple of months as well, where they bring the POS system right to the table, and you pay right there, and I can just scan my watch at the thing that they hold out for oh, me, and it all just that, works. That happens occasionally. As Outside well. of the U.S., that's the default. But uh, the U.S., you know, we're archaic in a lot of ways. So, uh. All right. So if you get a new phone and you've never had a phone before, right, what I would recommend you do is get an account, right? Assuming you never had a phone before, it means, like, you don't have an email. You don't have, you know, anything, right? Get accounts, right, that match the phone. If you have an yep. iPhone, just use the iCloud email, The right? Yep. Use all this stuff, right? If you have a Google Android phone, then... Get, you know, Gmail, right? A new account. Now, I would say if you have a very mixed ecosystem that already exists, but somehow are not using a phone, uh, Android is probably your best just default bet because generally all the random stuff that isn't Apple all kind of just works there well. But Apple does like to guide you toward using the Apple stuff. So if you yeah, if you the Google Google has apps for Google and Microsoft both have apps for pretty much everything on iPhone and yep. they all work just fine. Mostly um, you have to do some extra configuration. Like I had to do some fuckery to make sure all my calendar stuff on all my Apple Biz defaults to updating my Google Calendar and not the Apple like built-in oh. calendar. Oh, see, I think I just installed the Google Calendar app and I never used the Apple Calendar app. Yep, but like I use a reminder. I was like, hey, set a reminder. Like I, I every now and then I use some automation or some non-calendar function and I want it to make a calendar invite. And before I configured it, it would default to the Apple Calendar, even oh, yeah. though I, I just never use any of that. Yep, <laughs> so I started, but that's, but I'm saying that's a, <laughs> if you have a bunch of non-Apple stuff, you will have to go configure a bunch of things and you're not going to get all of them right away on your Apple yeah, device. If you tell Siri to, to like make a calendar event and you only have Google Calendar and it's not set up, then like, yeah, yep. it might be a hassle. But on Android, whatever random collection of bullshit you use, Android is really good about defaulting to whatever you tell it to and not having edge cases like that. Yep. Check would you know if you use any apps. Clearly, use something because you listen to a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know who is who will ever hear the words we're saying who does not already have a smartphone or at least an email account. Right. Like, <laughs> like if you exist, contact us. 
however it is you contact people, I really want to talk to you. <laughs> like, seriously, it's a pigeon or a raven's going to show up at your house. Like, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, you know, get the account that goes with the phone you get. Right. Yep. Uh, and try and what, what I see a lot of people what they do is when they get the when they get a phone is like oh what apps should I install never like, never never go down that road that is the that right. path leads you to misery do not ask that question what apps should you install instead just start using start using the phone and living your life right with the phone without putting any extra apps on there right and then whenever you need to do something right try to do it with the phone as it is right so it's like oh i need directions well i guess that would be the one actually i was about to say i was gonna do a whole separate bit one exception is even on the apple phone you should use google maps no matter what device you use anywhere on earth use google maps and do not use any other maps as of as of august 2022 actually you know yes and for the other the other app, the other maps are catching up to Google Maps. They're just still not there yet. But yeah, but they are. Which you know, they are still significantly behind in key areas. As of today, they are very behind. But they are. Google Maps is progressing more slowly, and they're progressing more quickly. So in a few years' time, it, it, it could change. But as I of now, doubt it. But we'll see. It's we possible. Could, but yeah. as of now, use Google. Google Maps would be the only thing. Don't use the Apple Maps. Yeah. Unless, like, you live in San Francisco, then it might be okay. Yep, something. especially if you use Google Maps for things like biking directions, like stuff that isn't just looking at what restaurants are nearby or like getting a car direction. I also don't right. super trust the Apple car directions. I have compared them before, you know, on trips, and Apple does not seem to be aware of traffic in a way that Google is. But anyway, well, Google bought Waze. Right? Yep, They're and Waze had it shit together. Anyway, but yeah, for everything besides directions, if you need to do something, just you try to use the apps that are already on the phone to yep. do that thing. Well, that case in point, I use Google Keep and I continued to use it when I migrated to iPhone. However, I if, also use Google Keep. If I were not already using Google Keep when I made the switch, I would probably just use like the Apple reminders and that would be it. No, the Apple Notes also. I had Apple Keep Notes. Is, Keep is sort of both of those in one. Exactly. But I'm already using Keep. But guess Google, what? Keep works just fine. Asks, I guess, is more like the reminders. Yeah, I guess. I On iPhone. Well, the, my worry is Keep and ta all, Again, the problem with Google is all their shit overlaps in weird ways. So nope, Keep, absolutely. Is, Keep is in a Venn diagram with like two other Google things that themselves are in a Venn diagram with a bunch of stuff on iPhone. Uh, so Scott's advice is best. If you don't already have a way that you do this that you like that works, just do whatever the phone makes easiest and it'll probably be the best option. All right. And then when you get into a situation where you want to do something with the phone, you have a need that is not fulfilled, then go find an app that does that thing. And, and my specific advice you. there, look for an, I hate to say this, look for an app that costs money uh, and avoid apps that are free with ads. Just generally. Uh, well, avoid anyone with ads for sure. Sometimes yep. there will be a one that's just free, free. That's truly free. That's good. But, you know, spend your time investigating them, trying them out and seeing, you know, which app is going to be the best one that meets this need that you don't have that yep. is fulfilled by the default apps on the phone. Now, right? here's a because very, a lot of, just about everybody has a phone full of apps that they don't even use, right? 99% of the time, just taking up space, invading their privacy, eating up the battery. Well, wasn't there just right? that thing? There's a shit ton of apps full of malware on the Android store that were only recently taken down. There's also that thing where like TikTok just straight up can key log you if you open its in-app browser. Yep. It's like you really do not want to use an app if you're not using the app, right? Keep yep. it minimal. All right, as much as you possibly can. And if you've got a new phone, it's easiest to do, right? So uh, if you already thing, have an iPhone and you're buying a new iPhone. Oh, well, there's one last thing, uh, which I guess also applies if you're switching phones. This applies to everybody, is that whenever you get a new device, right, especially if it's you've never had one before, go to the settings menu and go through just look at everything. every single setting go to every single settings menu from the top down and look at every setting don't necessarily read. change anything just understand you don't, you don't have to change anything but you should read every setting 
understand what that setting means. And if you're not like 100% sure that you want to change the setting, like you absolutely want to change it, don't change it. But just go through every setting, completely understand all of them, and just know and remember which ones exist. And then as you use the phone, you might come across a frustrating thing and you'll remember there was a setting for that. No. Right? And then, then you'll change the setting to, you know, to realize your preference, you know, doesn't align with it or whatever. Yep. But a lot of people just never go into their settings, never change them, never do anything. Anytime I get a new phone, anytime there's an OS update, anytime that anything, you know, even on computers, I go to the settings and I look through every possible setting and I make sure that they are set correctly. Usually it's rare that I change something, but you know, that's how it's very important to just know what's in there. Yep. Corollary to that, uh, don't hyper customize everything right away until you've used whatever the device is enough to get a sense of how it works and what you like and what you don't like. A lot of nerds in particular like to customize everything before they even try to use the thing. And that is often a way to increasingly get yourself into weird situations. Like, oh, my, this, this thing is broken. It's not working. Yes, yeah, because you messed with it a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the hardware itself, if you've got bad eyesight and, like, it's a problem, get a bigger phone. Uh, sure. I so I definitely the prefer... Font size, and you should. Yep. Granted, I prefer tiny in phones with tiny fonts, but I can see really well. So that's something mm -hmm. I have the luxury I, I of doing. I can see really well, and I'm turning up the font size anyway. It's like I can read the small font size, right? Just like I can read the bottom of the eye chart, right? Even someone with 20-20 perfect vision, they can read the bottom of the eye chart. But you know what? It's still easier to read a giant E than it is to at the top. I of don't the know. I'm chart. in the opposite. I've actually I've turned the font sizes way down on my iPhone phone just to fit more information on there yeah i mean i don't have a problem scrolling my watch has like the tiny it's just like a full web browser and tiny text on there and i can read it just fine i mean i can i can read it on the but it's pleasant size. for me like i i prefer it that way i like small fonts and dense text on all my devices that's all just right, me well your rims, rims are weirdo. It does everything weird, but it's like make the font size, whatever is comfortable for your eyeball. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But if you care about battery life, you're going to have to either get a big phone or an expensive phone. Yep. Phones More that batteries. are small, that aren't very expensive will not have long battery life. No. The th number one thing that kills battery life is, you know, apps that are running all the time doing bullshit. Right. And screens that are big and bright and are on too much. Right. It's like watching videos. The screen is on. It's bright because you're watching something. Yeah. It's just not it, the screen is is what's eating your battery. So that's why the watch saves so much battery because you're turning the screen on less. Right. The phone is in your pocket. The screen is not on. The battery is is barely draining. Right. Um, you know, big phones, they got a bigger screen, but they also got a bigger battery. So that sort of evens out the deal there, right? Yep. But, yeah, and you can also turn the brightness down, right? It's like, if it's night, you know, you don't need that much brightness to be able to see what's on the phone. You know, there's some usually an auto brightness setting. You should enable that, but also occasionally manually adjust it. If it's too bright, turn it down, right? You should only really need to do high brightness, like if you're using your phone in the sun or something like yep. that. If you're using a, an Android device, get whatever battery. If you're using an iPhone, honestly, get that Apple magnetic battery. That is... Wow. So the Apple I learned recently, I bought the Apple MagSafe battery. I'm happy with it. It's very nice. Oh, I love that thing. But it actually doesn't have that much capacity. No, uh, it's like, it's like what, two-thirds of a charge? Yeah, I, well, it's more than that, but it's the... Uh, I only bought it because it was like the first one, right? It was like there weren't any other competitors, Anchor now has a MagSafe battery oh. uh, that is vastly higher capacity than the official. The thing Apple is, I don't think I need that because my current phone with no battery will make it all day doing pretty much anything. That battery is only for weird situations or something like I am hiking literally 20 miles over the course of an entire day and I yeah, want the Strava to run the whole basically time. That's what I do too. It's like if most days my phone is in my house, it, I can plug it in and charge it whenever. I don't need to attach a battery to it. Right? Yeah. But... If I'm going out somewhere for a long extended period of the day, I'm not going to have an opportunity to charge, right? Am I going to a convention? Mm -hmm. I'm going on a bike ride. I'm going to a party, right? It's like, 
Then I get, I grab the battery and I attach it to the phone, right? Yeah. So I know for sure that I'm not gonna run out of power, right? I probably still won't run out of power without the battery. It's just a guarantee. Like, there's no way I'm gonna run out of battery, which is very important. <laughs> But uh, for anything super serious, like trips, I usually just have an external heavy battery that I plug in via a cable. But that's because I'm not using it while I'm like walking around. That would be if you're like in a multi-day scenario, right? Yeah. Like, where you were not going well, like, to power camping. Yeah. You know. Anyway. So the yep. other phone accessory that a lot of people get are cases. I was about to say, you have yeah. to... Be very, you have to be introspective. You have to look at your own life. If you're up, if you're replacing an existing phone, look at that phone and use it as an example. Are you the kind of person who destroys your phones routinely, or are you the kind of person who does not? And honestly, if you can get away with it, I'd advise using no case whatsoever. It's really pleasant to use a phone naked. They're designed for that. However... If you have a history or you believe that you are the kind of person who is going to drop your phone a bunch, uh, put a case on it because that is a very expensive piece of hardware. Well, I'd say before you put the case on the phone, I would say you should look at yourself, right? It's You can change yourself. I, w I, I am already getting past the point of I don't think the people who break phones routinely can change that about themselves. It, it may be the case, but if it is possible, right, you know, at least I, in my life, I always seek to change myself before I will change, try to change the world. I have never put my phones in cases in my entire life, and I've never regretted it. I did when I, you know, got like iPhone 3G, like way back in the day. I think by, I, I think by the time the iPhone, before the iPhone 3G was done, I had taken the case off and I don't think any other iPhone I had got a case. Yep. And I only broke a phone once when I fell off my bike. <laughs> so when I fell off my bike, uh, you know, the, in the injury where I had to take a picture of my I bits. I fell off on my own damn self. I didn't, nothing else caused me to fall, just my yep. own self. <laughs> nope, my, my, my fall over was a pothole that I was too slow to react to. But uh, I was just like standing there and I fell over sideways. Oh, no. no. <laughs> Everybody gets one in my bag. <laughs> and when I got to work, I took the phone out of the bag and it was broken. But one thing I will say is that all phones, but especially iPhones, but there are like Sony Android phones are similar in this boat. They are way more durable in the year 2022 than you probably realize. Phone durability has gone way just way in the up. last couple of years. Like it has skyrocketed. Well, this I think it's been, I think it's been progressing gradually, right, and and constantly. But I think it might have hit down. a tipping point between the like the new sapphire glass and some of the stuff they're doing. This iPhone like 13 SE. So I flipped over my handlebars, and the phone was in my hand at the time, like 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 held in one of my hands. So I flipped over and I landed with my full body weight on my phone. On rough concrete, the phone was completely fine. It has the tiniest scratch. Phones are fucking durable as crap nowadays. Right. A lot of my previous phones, which I did not put cases on, right, would often, by the time I was done with them, have various, like, you know, minor scratches and cosmetic damage, you know, rough edges, a few, maybe like a dent here or there, right? Micro scratches, things like that, right? This iPhone 12 is almost two years old, right? Because iPhone 14s are going to be announced in a month. Yeah. Right? It's almost it's almost two years old. If I clean the screen, it is 100% smooth, right? 100%. There is not any visible scratch of even a small cosmetic nature anywhere on that screen. I could, pro you know, I've never put my phone in my pocket with my keys, and I still won't, but I probably could. Yeah. Right? Because something that they've done has just made it that much better. You may not need it. If you're only slightly clumsy, right, and not, you know, extremely clumsy and uh, haphazard, you may be able to get away without a case, whereas previously you needed one. Now, that said, so. this really only applies to the upper tier Android phones, like the the high quality ones from the, the expensive quote. Expensive phones are the more durable phones. Yep. The cheap ones are made of plastic with less expensive glass and they break e more, e much more easily. But the cheapest iPhone is more durable than like the middle range Android phone on average. Yeah, it depends on which one it is. But yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, if you can get away with it, get away with it. Uh, and the final topic is cables, right? Hopefully, 
The iPhone 14 will take USB-C. We're hoping for it, right? We're <laughs> it, it, we, we're gonna find out soon. I hate like I hate this Lightning cable. I hate everything about Lightning cables. I hate the like fact the that this device, phone one device with a Lightning cable and everything else in your whole life is like USB. Yep, cable. I had to buy a bunch of Lightning cables when I bought this fucking iPhone. Right, buy whatever phone you got. Buy third-party cables that are high quality. If you buy cheap cables, they're gonna break. You can get nice freaking long ones that are durable as hell. You can get a third-party charger with like a whole bunch of charging yep. ports on it, right? That charges fast, right? Don't work, don't use the freaking included charger nonsense unless that's all you've got, really. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess last in terms of actually the logistics of you have a new phone uh, and you had an old phone as opposed to nothing. If it's an Apple device, just do the Apple thing that like basically just copies everything over to your new phone. It just works on Android. Honestly, you, there there are sort of equivalents. I would advise, especially with Android, just setting everything up brand new on your new Android phone and only using the Android sync stuff to copy over your data. Uh, not And maybe use the App Store to copy over the apps you have installed. But honestly, the Android experience is not nearly as good in that, uh, in that vein. I, I've never experienced that. I guess you've never experienced switching from one iPhone to another iPhone? I will at some point. The way the way it works, oh, you, you put them next to each other and they say hi. Right. It used to be it used to be more difficult, but the way it works now is that you have iCloud backup enabled, which I strongly recommend having a backup of your phone, right? Because you're gonna want to set the security setting on your phone to automatically erase your phone if someone tries to log in and fails too many times. Yep. Right. So no one can get into your phone. And you won't care if your phone got erased because you have an iCloud backup that's automatic and you could just get a phone and restore it. And then your phone will just, after you restore it, it's it feels like that's your phone. Like you never, nothing got lost at all whatsoever. Right? Yep. So turn on iCloud backups, pay for Apple storage space if necessary, if your phone has too much data that you need to back up. And then with the way it works is when you get a new phone, you just hold the phones near each other and it's like, okay, I see your old phone. I know how to find your iCloud backups. I know who you are. And it just restores the backup on the new phone as if it's the same process, basically. Mm -hmm. And like in a matter of minutes, you know, once it's done doing all its bullshit, there you go. It's like your phone is completely transferred over. Congrats. Right. There may be a few things that won't just transfer. Um, you know, like you, maybe Google Auth if you're using that, but I recommend fi <laughs> switching to a different solution to avoid that. I want to say there was, I haven't checked because I don't use Google Auth anymore, but there was, I think there might have been a change where you could transfer to a new phone in a way that you couldn't it did before. did add that feature, but it's still, it's not going to be included automatically with the yep. cloud. Backup. I mean, I, I bailed anyway. I use YubiKey for everything now. Yep, same. Uh, and last, there is one concern that only applies to Android, but it is important. I would avoid Android phones that have a weird Android version that was made by a carrier or a company. Mm -hmm. when it, the In order, get an Android phone made by Google that just has stock Android. Like, that is your best option. Mm -hmm. Second best, but actually acceptable, is Sony. Because for whatever reason, Sony has the best hardware still of any Android phone. It's not as good as an iPhone hardware, but it's still pretty good. But... Sony does have their Sony Android. Not only is it 99% the same as stock Android, but it gets updates for a very, very long time in a way that very few other weird Androids do. Yeah, Sony newest, is the only the acceptable Pixel one. Phone, they're promising five years of updates. So that's pretty good. That's it's pretty good. good. iPhones, but it's better than before where they were only doing like three years. I mean, I was getting Sony Android updates on my Xperia that, that I used for like five Four and a half years, just fine. Four and a half, okay, so, you know, five, but yeah. Yeah, I think it kept going with security updates, but I bailed. And while we're talking about updates, right, if there are updates to apps and the OS on your phone, install them at your earliest convenience always. Don't yep. sit around not updating the phone. Update it. You might be like, yeah, one of those people complaining you don't like the update. Tough shit. Update it immediately because they're usually fixing security vulnerabilities. And if your phone is compromised, your life is fucked, right? If there is an update for your phone, you should be like, you know, it's not an emergency, but you should update it within like a day, like that night at the latest. My phone being compromised is more dangerous to me than my fucking computer being compromised. 
That's right. So update the phone. Uh, and of course, you know, the longer the phone, when the phone stops getting updates, right? You don't it's done. It out, right? But you should sell that phone or recycle it or, or it, trade it in. I would suggest on a new phone. I would you suggest can't to do so. I have done this for a while and it has saved my butt a couple times. If you upgrade to a new phone, and the old phone still works. It's not like the carrier frequencies changed and it literally doesn't work anymore. Like that happens occasionally. Mm -hmm. If you can afford not trading it in, keeping the old phone as a backup phone is not the worst idea. Because if something happens to your phone and you're like about to go on a trip or something, just popping your SIM back to the old phone and having a smartphone that works and is already set up pretty well for you, not bad. That saved my butt once. Yeah, every iPhone I've ever had, I have, you know, given to a friend, sold, traded in, you know, did something yep. to, to... But I still got this in, Sony Xperia you know. right here. I actually had it out recently because I was making sure it had all these updates. If something happens to my iPhone, I would use this until I got my iPhone replaced. Right. But my backup phone is an iPhone 7. And the iPhone 7 is going to n stop getting updates. I think it got its last update already, probably. Yeah. And so that's a problem now. And that it's like, well, it's my backup phone, but I it still works just fine. I could use it in an emergency, but it not being updated is sort of like... Now, we're at a cliff right now. A lot of old phones don't support 5G. And I got to tell you, if you have a phone that doesn't support 5G, you're going to find that a lot of areas don't have 4G that works anymore. Uh, 4G is still out there. So uh, so you'd think that. I, I, so, I, so I have my iPhone and my Sony, and I did some tests uh, be, for a bunch of reasons a while ago. 4G does not work in a lot of LIC. All right. Well. 5G works fine. Oh, that, sure. That's in one place. The point: if you look at maps, five four four G coverage is vast worldwide, yep. and five G coverage is not right. The most places don't have five G. But as time goes on, next five to ten years, right, you're gonna start seeing the you know turning off of the right. Yeah, might have six G by then. Who the hell knows, right? But yeah, you're you're gonna a phone will stop working. So the listener <laughs> asked a question. Normally we would stop here. We've already gone long, but we skipped a show and we had a lot to get out. You know, we we miss when we skip a geek nights. It all just sort of crams into our brain. There's like a backlog in there, words to say. But uh, especially because with COVID, we still don't see each other that often. Like mm. I don't see Scott in person more often than like once every other week. Mm. So uh, the listener asks, and I actually have some thoughts on this. Any thoughts on buying used? phones refurbished phones previous gen phones they i would are. say one refurbished phones are often not a great idea because they often do not have a great battery life yeah so it depends right so that's true you a refer someone's gonna turn in a lot of people will get a phone with a sad battery however right? if you are poor a refurbished phone where they have replaced the battery with some third-party battery that phone is going to be real cheap, and it's going to be pretty good for you, even though or it's a refurbished phone. And you get a ba you buy a battery, and right, it's like yep. You know. If you're poor, a refurbished phone is probably a great idea. A refurbished phone that's a good phone that you just have to plug an anchor into all the time because the battery in it sucks. That's better than no phone. Yeah. Right, so if a, a used phone, a cheap phone, an old phone, are if you don't have a lot of money, are indeed a great idea as long as the phone is compatible and still getting software updates, like we mentioned. Right, yep. you don't want to get a phone like like I just said, my iPhone Seven just went out of style. Right, so you know if you buy an iPhone Nine, I don't even know if that's such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> is there a Nine? I, I forget. I mean, Thirteen like, SE is when I made the jump. Whichever, yeah, whichever one they had, or, you know, it's like. But the thing is, it's like, well, you could buy a refurbished, right, phone, uh, but, you know, they still sell, like, iPhone 11s for, like, 500 bucks, right? They sell the iPhone SE. How much does that thing cost, right? Uh, for $430, right? So it's like, should you be getting a refurbished phone or an old used phone really depends on the price if you get say you find like yeah. a refurbished iphone 12 for like 150 bucks hell yeah well, you're not gonna find one that cheap right you might you might but compare compare they still sell older phones right you know it's like you know would you get a refurbished iphone 11 
or a you know a you know you can get like maybe a pixel 7 or not 7 that's that would be that's like a new one pixel 5 right because 6 6 and 7 are out now i guess you know it's like you got to look at the prices there might i would i would suggest go there for might look be a new phone of an old model might or might not be a better option than a refurbished phone yep i i would say in a generally of course you have to do your research like if you're hunting for deals you got to hunt for deals like look for the perfect it's better arm. For the environment to get the used phone yeah but uh in a pinch i would it's suggest e it's uh, it's eco sensible a new phone from a previous generation or a refurbished phone from the current generation are both the best options in that space generally. Yeah. Uh, just as long as the phone is still getting updates and, you know, it's in good shape. Yep. And you may or may not need to get the battery replaced. Don't be afraid of if you can't do it yourself because you're not a tech wizard, right? And you're afraid to open up your phone. Don't be afraid of phone repair places, right? Um, they're like, they actually can repair phones. Yep. And if you're worried about data privacy, like, especially if it's not an iPhone, just get, have them fix the hardware and then wipe the thing. <laughs> like, no, wipe it. Have them fit. Right. You back up your phone, right? Back no. up your phone, wipe it, let them repair, rep swap the battery. They give it to you. Right. Then put your, then load your backup. Right. But yeah, I think iPhone is going to add it soon, like a repair mode where, you know, people can. You know, won't need to unlock your phone in order to, to fix it. So yeah, well, Apple Day is coming up. We'll have a lot to say about that. But I think we have gone on plenty long. All right.